Welcome everyone. We're just waiting for everybody to join us and then we'll go ahead and get started. Hello to everyone who's joined us and welcome to our international panel for the Harvard Medical School Master of Science in Bioethics program. My name is Rebecca Brendel and I'm the director of the Center for Bioethics and also the director of the um, Master of Bioethics uh, program. I'm joined by several members of our uh, wonderful education team uh, this morning to make this webinar happen and to help answer all of your questions. Um, let me introduce you to Jesse Tucker, who so many of you have been in touch with regularly as you apply to the program. He's our recruitment and admissions coordinator. Um, we're also joined by Sam Picken, our education program administrator and by Joni Vyshansky, our Associate Faculty Director of the Virtual Program and Co-Director of our Capstone Experience. And you'll be hearing a lot more from Joni and the panelists in just a few minutes. Let me start to say by saying that from the very beginning of the Master of Bioethics Program, we imagined that uh, one of the goals would be to create an international community of people doing work in bioethics. And we're so thrilled to have so many of you joining us today. We are now in the process of beginning admissions for our 10th entering class. And so uh, over a decade, it's been an amazing opportunity to reflect upon what we've done at the Harvard Medical School Master of Science in Bioethics program over this time. We have had students from every uh, continent uh, on, on the globe uh, that's inhabited by humans. Uh, we still have not brought penguins into the fold, uh, but we really um, are delighted that uh, the community continues to grow. And in particular, the Master of Science and Bioethics program is a rich experience for international students because of the diversity of viewpoints back there uh, in terms of their life experience. Um, and in our virtual and in-person classrooms, we have students from around the world who come together to learn, share, and reflect on the most pressing issues facing us um, globally and internationally. But coming to the, this wonderfully vibrant classroom, as you'll hear from our students in just a short moment, is really just the beginning because the relationships that are formed and built in the course of the program continue for a lifetime, not just between faculty and mentors and students, but between students themselves who are already out in the world leading in the global bioethics community. And what, once students come to the program, even just today, you'll begin to experience what that global community is like. So just to give you a sense of some of the things our graduates are doing, we have graduates all over North America who are working in, in uh, bioethics programs, in clinical ethics, in research ethics across the US and Canada. And then abroad outside of North America, uh, we have students who have graduated and are in Japan leading in technology, health, law, and medicine. We have students who are teaching reproductive law and ethics in Australia. Uh, running clinical trial ethics in Liberia, developing clinical ethics programs across the globe from Saudi Arabia and Malaysia to Mexico and beyond. We have students who are advancing human rights in New Zealand and students who are doing work in clinical ethics, uh, uh, industry, uh, technology and research in the UK and across Europe. There's literally no corner of the world that's untouched and now with Zoom, as we're all experiencing now, uh, and we continue to work with our students, we've had uh, ethics programming bringing together faculty and students from Harvard uh, with students around the world. Um, in case we have anyone joining us from Hong Kong today, uh, in addition to our current student, a wonderful relationship over the past number of years with Hong Kong University and medical students, um, uh, and the list goes on and on and on. 
So uh, you're not here to hear me today, but really to hear from the stars of our show, which are our uh, current students who can tell you the most uh, about experiencing the Master of Science in Bioethics program at Harvard Medical School. And with that and no further ado, it's my great pleasure to introduce the Associate Faculty Director of the Master of Science program, and Associate Director of the Virtual Master's Program, Joni Vyshansky, who will bring on our panel uh, and get us started off. Thanks for being here. Thanks, Joni. Great. Thanks, Becca. And I wanna um, welcome everyone to this um, session and we really look forward to hearing from our panelists. I, I wanna also thank you all who submitted questions ahead of time and our goal is to hopefully address all those. And really it's not going to be me speaking, it's going to be the panelists. And um, I have a set of questions for them and I think you will hopefully get all the answers that you want um, that you've asked us previously. Um, and uh, again, I thank you for that. And then at the end, we will share some specifics about the program and applying. And if there's still time, we'll answer any additional questions that you can put into the Q&A um, and we'll add those to the list. But let's get started. And the first um, thing I'm going to ask um, each of you to do um, is to introduce yourself, including your name and where you're from. And then very specifically, um, what motivated you to apply to the graduate program to a graduate program in the United States, which sometimes might seem daunting to many of you who are joining. Um, and then were there specific factors perhaps or features of the program that attracted you? So um, Abdul Rahman, why don't we start with you? Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. So my name is Abdul Rahman Harabi. I'm joining from Saudi Arabia. I am second year virtual students. So my experience so far was great. Actually, I joined the program for after completing two years of my career in National Committee of Bioethics. So I decided this, this is the time to kind of develop my knowledge, develop my skills in bioethics. So while I was searching for the specific uh, master, I kind of looked out to Harvard because to be honest, bioethics field is not as a, any other science field that only a path. So there's many thought, there are many, many perspectives to be considered. So I want a program that can have special diversity special knowledge, special perspective. So Hartford kind of gave me that opportunity, especially with the virtual opportunity, kind of working and, and completing my educations with a great, great participant, great uh, classmate from all around the world. So that's the main goal that I choose this program. That's great, thank you. And Ardita, I see you agreeing and you're in person. So maybe you could introduce yourself. Thank you for the opportunity, Joni. So hi, everyone. My name is Ardita, and I'm a physician from Indonesia. Um, the reason why I wanted to join the bioethics program in Harvard, especially in person, is because I'm taking a capstone about um, genomics. And being in Boston, especially in Cambridge, I think it's the best place to discover new technologies, especially in health, because there's so many health startups and opportunities around Harvard and around Boston itself. Yeah. Great, thanks. And Roger, um, you're joining from yet another place. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Roger Chung. Um, I am joining from Hong Kong. Uh, it's 11 p.m. right now over here. So Good evening, everybody. Um, and um, yes, I I joined the Harvard program online because um, uh, I I am a full time associate professor at the School of Public Health and Primary Care at the Chinese University of Hong, of Hong Kong. Uh, my research uh, focused on um, health equity, uh, end of life care. Um, and also social determinants of health, which have very strong underpinning, ethical underpinning. Um, so, you know, when I was um, researching around, um, so obviously Harvard um, MBE program um, was one of the top choices. And um, I know that there will be, you know, the people who are signing up for this MBE program will be uh, intelligent. Um, they are um, definitely intellectually curious, um, you, and 
I, I know that, you know, we're going to have very good discussions in class. So this is one of the major reasons why I chose um, the Harvard MBA program. And I'm also myself running uh, a center for bioethics um, at my own university, um, which is really um, quite new um, and is a, is a burgeoning field in, in Hong Kong right now. So I would like to learn from the best of the best. Thank you. Thank you. And certainly you're bringing a lot to the program um, based on what you do and such. And, you know, that does help create lots of differences um, and coming certainly in the online aspect of things. Mm -hmm. And Felix, um, please introduce yourself. Good morning from Boston. So about 10 a.m., so 11 hours earlier than in Hong Kong. So I was born in Germany lived actually most of my life in Switzerland, and uh, I had my last job in Australia. And uh, that's also the main motivation for me to do bioethics, because I just saw in my work that there are so many bioethical questions which we don't really know how to address, or we address them in a really poor way. And I felt that the Master of Science in Bioethics really gives me the skill set to be better at my work and also to drive maybe some impact in the field. So um, what it also then makes it distinctive is, I think, the capstone program, because through the capstone, you do exactly that. So you choose one topic and you combine the academic view with like a real world application. And I think that really yeah, made it unique and was the reason for me to apply for it. Yeah, that's great. And um, as Becca mentioned, I'm one of the co-directors of the capstone program. And one of the things we'll make sure that we highlight for all the um, attendees today is a little more detail about the capstone. So thanks for at least introducing that, Felix, at this point. Um, let's start um, with you again, um, you and Ardita being um, in person and um, ask you the following question. Um, were there any specific challenges perhaps that you faced um, or highlights perhaps rather than challenges, um, you know, as you sort of arrived here in the U.S. and started a, a program um, so Felix, why don't you continue? Yes, so I think the first real challenge or topic I faced was finding housing. And it actually started in May and the MBE community really helped with that because we had a call for the initially admitted students. And I met two really nice MBE students. I didn't know them back then, but we all had the same problem. We were internationals or at least not from Boston and we didn't have housing. So we all ended up living together actually because uh, we did the housing hunt together and uh, now we have the what we call the MBE fun house as uh, we became roommates. So uh, that was actually, I would say the first uh, challenge I faced. Well, certainly that can be um, a challenge and I'm glad that it worked out the way that it did. Ardita, um, what about you? Uh, my, my challenge is probably just being in the U.S. alone because I'm very long way from home. And sometimes as international student, especially being the first time um, having education abroad, is feeling homesick. And um, you really try to find your own community in the U.S. And I found my classmates are very, very helpful, especially um, when I'm living in Cambridge. Uh, the other part of Boston, commu commuting from Boston to Cambridge itself has been so fun because uh, in our bioethics program, we have classmates over in Cambridge and we kind of try to get together just talking about, you know, class and life and bioethics classmates uh, are like my family now. So been very, it's been challenging, but I'm really grateful for all the faculty and classmates that I have met. Yeah, that's great. And um. You know, I'll start with you, Raja. You're in one time zone and Abdul Rahman is in another time zone, um, completely opposite. Um, and so that might be one of the challenges here, but um, what things can you describe as certainly even facing an online program um, and that perhaps this was the first online program um, each of you ever did? Um, Raja, want to comment on that? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, well, as I said, um, you know, because I have a full time job, I have to be very committed to my my own job. So this is really probably the only option that I have that I have to do it online, not in person. Um, but I 
Uh, well, if you're talking about challenges, I would say that um, it could be quite challenging. Uh, I still remember the first two weeks um, that I have to really kind of adopt to that, <laughs> um, uh, you know, learning uh, environment that is going to be online. But at the same time, you're you're really juggling with your own, um, you know, teaching duties and research and um, you know, all the things that you have to do, you know, with a full-time job. So I feel like, you know, this is also another huge, you know, thing, uh, in, in my, in my own life, um, you know, while you're actually trying to finish all the different things in your own work. Um, and then, um, the foundations course was, um, the first, um, it was my first exposure to, to this program. It's a fantastic course. Um, that being said, there's a lot of uh, readings and um, and and if you really put the time to it, um, then you really do learn a lot, I have to say. And then you can you can really be engaged in very um, thought provoking discussions. Um, and this is what I try to do. Right. So I, I try to finish all my readings, did all my homeworks and all that stuff. But I, I would say it is. It could be quite challenging doing it part time, but is extremely rewarding. Um, yeah. So this is what I have to juggle with, and sometimes um, some classes may happen during funny hours for me. <laughs> um, but I, you know, when I sign up for it, I I have already expected that, so you know, I'm mentally prepared for um, these challenges. So that's. I think what people have to do, they have to be psychologically, mentally uh, be prepared for uh, uh, what's to come. <laughs> yeah. I, I think you're right. Um, and time management is a huge part of taking um, any kind of program, but certainly an online program and making time to get all your readings done and such. And that prep work up front before you are in classes is, is critical. And then you get more out of it. Um, but you do adjust. And as long as you know that going in, as you said, then, um, yeah. you know, you make that commitment and you continue. Um, Abdul Rahman, why don't you sort of take that from here? What What is your take on um, how you've adjusted to this? Well, yeah, it's for, for challenging, I think we are kind of all virtual students, especially from outside the US, kind of have the similar challenging, especially working full time. And the timing, if you are kind of all in time zone, that kind of difficult with your classes, I think that's one of the most difficulty that you face. But to be honest, I thought it would be much harder after the next uh, first two weeks, three weeks, it kind of used to it. And to be honest, sometimes when you can vacation, you kind of miss it. You kind of have your, start your schedule, so you kind of get used to it. But I think with time, with commitment, you kind of, you have to go through it and there is no journey with uh, any other challenging because with, with especially if you see the reward, especially the, what, what you kind of get from that experience, that uh, journey, I think is much, much higher than the effort and the challenge you have to are facing. Yeah, you, you sort of answered um, kind of the next question I was going to ask um, about um, what pleasantly surprised you. And it sounds like, you know, you adapted well and that you were able to get to that place um, where you're, you know, it's just sort of automatic and, um, I, I love that you said that, you know, then you miss that um, time period um, of when you're not um, doing it. So I, I think that that's, um, that's great. I, I'll let sort of open to, um, to anyone who wants to comment on this, but um, any other differences um, you noticed other than what we've already highlighted of being a student um, in your own country versus being a student um, in the States and um, maybe, you know, Ardita, Felix, since you're, you know, here in Grant, uh, you know, on campus and such. Um, any comments you have about that? I would say it's like 100% different than it used to be for me in Switzerland. And the main reason being it is way more personal, even though you mm -hmm. might think like Harvard is one of the biggest and best unis and like thousands of students there. So it will be like impersonal and you will just be a number in a way, but it's the direct opposite. So Everyone knows your name, you engage with your professors, you engage with your classmates. It's really a sense of community. And that is very different to like studying one of the big programs, either be it like medicine or law or business or whatever it is in Europe. At least for me, in my experience, we were always in a way a number for a final written exam. And it's very different here. 
Yeah, I would the data like was that your. Oh yeah, no, go ahead. <laughs> um, I think that's a great way to describe our class because even though there's almost thirty eight or forty people, I guess in our class, it still feels very personal, even through the questions that the faculty gave us through our tasks. So I think it's really, really um, a pleasant surprise for me because I thought bioethics, we're only going to talk about theories and the fundamentals of like four principles of BNC, but it's more of a self-reflection. So I think for people that's going to apply, you don't have to worry about your knowledge about bioethics because honestly, when I was in medical school, it's very closed. And I thought coming to this program, I would have, I would fall, fall in behind, but the faculty really makes us uh, feel comfortable and not um, being sort of pressure and stuff. So it's really, really great. Well, it's great to hear that as a, as a faculty, as one of the, the leaders in the department as well, that I feel like we're all doing our job then, that our faculty are, are doing um, their job and that bringing in the right complement of students too, um, so that everyone does feel supported and encouraging others and making that environment. Um, so that's, um, that's really you know, great to hear. Um, I don't know, Roger, Abdurrahman, any other comment on it or, you know, just throw that back to you. No, I, I have to agree, to be honest, the structure of learning the process in this master can be amazing. It's not a, only a passive process that lecture you can dump your information on your student and you can just take it and learn it. But once it's a thoughtful interaction process, you have to share and learning by sharing and discussions. So that's very interesting to see multiple perspectives from all the from all different in the world. You can see everyone have different perspective. How do you can see this issue? How do they tackle these issues? That to be honest, the most interesting and thoughtful and provoking uh, experience you have. That's great. Roger, what about the online interactions and such? You know, that can be very different. Um, what, what's that really like? Maybe you could share that with the people uh, that are attending. I think, yeah, I think what surprised me is that I, I think everyone is very engaged um, during class. I, I like that the a lot of the classes are very structured. Um, and, you know, a lot, you know, for example, um, I'll just give an example in the introduction for clinical ethics, um, the class, um, it usually starts off with, you know, a little bit of a lecture, not, not a whole lot uh, about some theories and principles, but then they'll then introduce um, a case for you guys, for, for, the, for the students to discuss, and then we'll be in breakout rooms. I like it that, yeah, I, I like it because, you know, in the breakout rooms, you know, which is smaller, you have like around three to four people really um, deep diving into the particulars of the cases. And, and you know, we, we all have our chances to share our, our own um, opinions. And I feel that is a very safe place for us uh, to share all, our own opinions. You know, it's, and, and then, you know, hearing the diverse, perspectives from all the different people from around the world. It's just, uh, I think it's an amazing and eye opener for me, an amazing experience for me. I, I, I really like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. Um, Ardita, can you comment on how you break out into the different um, sections in foundations and what that's like? Because that will kind of complement, I think, what, what Roger said. I know you have smaller groups as well. Yes, so in foundations, we do have small group discussion and I think it's really great because um, listening to our peers talking about one of the, I think foundations honestly is one of the challenging subjects because it is foundations by its name itself. But listening to our peers and talk about our small group discussion, it really simplifies the subject itself because our classmates are really trying hard to incorporate their own experience with their own language. So having, listening to our peers talking about philosophy, it is so, so helpful uh, for me at least because I have never had exposure about philosophy like Kant or utilitarian um, principles. So it's really helpful. That's great. Felix, is that the same experience you've had or? 100% agree. So I think these breakout discussions normally like groups of four and you have probably two MDs, one person with a non-medical background, either business or law or something else. And then 
yeah, probably another like medical related role and you are from all over the world and you discuss the same case and issue. It feels like every class is its own consortia. So it's really exciting to be part of that. Yeah. You know, yeah, go ahead, Roger. Yeah, I just want to say, even outside of the classrooms, we have office hours, we have facilitated facilitated learning groups. I think those are very helpful um, because, you know, when you, you want to clarify some concepts um, that maybe you don't have time during class to clarify, then, you know, office hours is just a perfect time for you to clarify that. And also the FLGs, as I've mentioned. Yeah, you know, you really do... Um get to know people in a different way. And I'm sure you all have um, separate other groups that you create outside of um, the actual classes. Um, you know, I, I know that students create their own individual Google groups so that you can have other communications and continue some of the discussions. And I think that that also helps engage everyone and, you know, take a little bit outside of the classroom and get to know each other in that way as well and know that everyone is there to to help you uh, the, the other thing is what you highlighted um certainly felix is um we're coming together um from all different walks of life and i know um individuals i, I looked at all the individuals that registered for this um panel presentation and they are lawyers and physicians and nurses and researchers and people from all over um, the world um, who have signed up for this. So I think having you comment on that is, is certainly very, very helpful and really demonstrates um, that everyone comes together and everyone comes with different levels of experience. Ardita, just as you said, um, you know, and I understand that first and foremost. Um, so, um, and this sort of takes us to maybe just another thing, um, sort of student life and networking. Um, you know, we try um, as a center, we have many other kinds of events that we have hosted um, platforms so that, you know, there's some social integration, but also networking so that you can figure out maybe what you're gonna do next or that um, you're in this program and you get to know a lot of people, but, uh, they stay part of your network, but maybe um, some of the things that we've offered or that you've all attended and um, Abdulram, and I know you attended an event last um, week, as a matter of fact, maybe you could start and comment on the other things that we really try to have um, available to you across the um, university as well. Yeah, that's also one, one thing that I really like about the program. It's not only stopped in the class, it kind of offers some additional activity as uh, some informal, some informal activities. The last or the, I think last week or the week before, we have some virtual event that we can con conducted by the centers and can allow us to sit to one person with uh, one of the faculty and one of the experts and kind of discuss what your goals are like, what is your goals, what your thoughts. So it can expand in your personal networking uh, area and what your thought, what your experience. Also, you can have some feedback on your work, especially for the capstone, et cetera. So you can, you can imagine that the many thought, many experience that can uh, take from the informal or formal activity that the center offer. Yeah. Has, have others of you participated? Um, I know, Ardita, I've seen you at lots of events. Um, and how, how has that played um, for you and your overall experience? Thank you, Jody. Yes, um, it's been really exciting for me to go to all of these events, even the virtual ones. And I also want to highlight um, that we also have classes together with the virtual students. So Abdul Rahman, I know you before this panel because we've been through research mm -hmm. ethics class together. So it's been really good. Um, the faculty have done a great job to incorporate not only virtual students, but also mix us together between the virtual and in-person so we don't miss anyone. So it's been great. Yeah. Oh, that's a great point. Go ahead, Felix. Yeah, maybe just looking at the schedule right now of university events organized just like in the last weeks and it looks like every second day is another one so i think harvard like in general has so many events so it's really about prioritizing to your time and figuring out which one you want to attend so ranging from like a couple of weeks ago i went to the healthcare innovation summit which you can think of it's like a panel discussion and a career fair afterwards there is the very famous gay lecture where it's more about content input and dinner and uh, like there are so many 
different events that it's really about prioritizing and choosing which one you have time to attend. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it could get overwhelming because you can't go to every single one of them. So you try to pick and choose. Um, Roger, have you been able to take advantage of any of the um, virtual online events? Um, I actually haven't really had time to participate in those events. Uh, yeah, I apologize. But, you know, I, I, you know, kept in touch with um, quite a number of um, classmates, um, you know, through personal contacts. And, yeah. you know, yeah, th and that, that was great because, you know, when I, um, this summer, I traveled to um, uh, America and, and, and Canada, and I met up with some of uh, my fellow classmates. And that's good. <laughs> That's great. And please, no apologies for not attending. Um, you know, um, many things we record, um, want everyone to know that, and we try to share. And and sometimes with busy schedules, it's difficult to um, to attend them. And, um, you know, we completely understand understand that. So definitely no when, apologies. When necessary. I got this invitation, when I got this invitation, I, I you know, I immediately wanted to participate. <laughs> yeah, well, we were delighted that you could join us today. Um, we're delighted that all of you can join us today. It's, um, it's, it's really great. Um, great conversation. Um, I, I know I was going to um, ask specifically about housing, but I think we um, kind of covered that. Um, and so, um, Ardita, is there anything you would want to add about um, housing? Are you living in the housing that's supplied by the university? Uh, yes. So you're I, not. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I am uh, living in under Harvard housing um, apartments. So it has been also a challenge for me because we needed to do the lottery process and have to keep in contact with the Harvard housing, even when before moving to Boston. So the time zone will be quite challenging, but it's a process we that we have to go through. I know it's going to be hard. I don't want to sugarcoat the housing process, as Felix said, but it's going to be a great um, experience. And I think my tip would be to always start early for the application and always keep your eye on the Harvard University Housing Graduate um, website. So that's great. Yeah, it is. It's starting early and it's paying attention, right? Um, the main things, um, obviously. Um, so let, let's shift a little. Um, I know um, uh, we got several questions um, ahead of time about um, courses. And um, we've already kind of talked about foundations a little bit um, and clinical ethics. Um, but let, let's sort of go in another direction. Um, there's lots of electives we offer. And some of you have been able to um, sort of start already taking electives, but maybe we could go around and um, comment on what electives that you've gotten to take, or at least pick one um, that someone else doesn't pick um, and comment on it. And Abdul Rahman, I know one of the courses you took was neuroethics. So maybe you could highlight that. Um. Yeah, it was points I, I didn't know the, about the topic for taking the the classes, but I think it was very interesting to see the complexity of that course. And especially it was only one month, quite comprehensive, but I think give us many point of view, many uh, perspective to think about that, many challenging that this technology or this area of technology that can face and what is the dilemma that can currently facing, what optional solution, what optional thought that can be solved. So I think neuroethics, one of the most interesting class that I took over the this uh, master. Great. Roger, what about you? What with some of your perhaps even, you know, favorite or uh, less favorite classes that you've taken? I really enjoyed, well, uh, besides foundations and clinical ethics, but, but I have to say, I really enjoy those two. Um, they, they're probably my favorites, um, but I also okay. took global health ethics, um, animal ethics, and also uh, neural ethics as, as electives. And probably I will take the ethics of AI um, in the coming semester uh, also as an elective. Um, yeah, and I, I, I have to say, I, I really enjoyed all the classes, all the readings. I, I feel the reading lists are very helpful um, for me to really um, gain a foundational knowledge of um, the literature um, that are important. Uh, to know um, in in the respective fields. So, and the, again, the in-class discussions are always very um, engaging, very 
um, fruitful. Um, and it's just very great to hear the perspectives, the international perspectives from other people around the world, because, um, you know, one thing that we learn in bioethics is that, you know, everyone has a blind spot, right? And we are only looking at um, a certain case or a certain subject matter from our own vantage point. And therefore, we need other people to kind of, um, you know, not only supplement, but, you know, really to to point out the limitations of your own uh, of your own perspective and learn from them mm -hmm. and 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 that is really you know the robust pluralism of bioethics <laughs> well i don't think i could say it any better than you just did so that's great and you um certainly highlighted um key elective courses that we offer there's so many and so many coming up um felix what have you been able to um take advantage of and take and how has it worked for you Yes, so I actually took advantage of the cross registration for my elective. So in addition to the bioethics uh, electives, you can also cross register to MIT to other Harvard schools. And I think it's about 12,000 courses in the Canvas system you can choose. So it's really, again, prioritizing what you really want to do. And I took entrepreneurship of life science, which uh, is offered by HBS. And it was really a very interesting conversation because you have three CEOs joining each week and uh, they introduce their company in the life science field. They introduce what they are doing. And then you can also challenge them from a bioethical perspective, engage with them, ask them, like, how do they think about bioethical issues in their work? And I think that uh, that really complemented the bioethical education in the core courses with just, let's say, a bit more the business perspective of some of these distinctive leaders and asking them on uh, their perspective what they think are the pressing issues. So that has been really interesting. Yeah, you, you bring up a, an excellent point, uh, not only in the business school, but um, uh, MIT, um, you can take classes there, um, School of Public Health, medical school, law school. And, and that really um, does um, increase the number of uh, choices that you have. So there's a lot of choices. Um, Ardita, what have you? Um, taken or plan to take coming up? Uh, so this semester, I haven't had the chance to take any electives because uh, I took the consortia, the research ethics consortia. And I really want to take a moment to have give a shout out to Inso Hyun and Lauren Walsh, because through the research ethics consortia, not only it introduces to all of these new technology in the industry, but also giving us the real life perspective, like how does bioethics apply in everyday life, especially in new technology and new advances. And they both really brought topics that are mind blowing. And I've never even had the chance to know about, for example, prolonging a dog's uh, life or biopreservation. And even we talked about organ transplantation and health equity through research ethics and source chef. So it was so it was really great, not only theories, but also the application of bioethic, bioethics, which is very much important, I guess, for me, uh, for after graduating the bioethics program and how would we navigate uh, through the career plans and stuff. So I think the research ethic consortium was really great. And for the upcoming semester, there have been a lot of courses, even in bioethics, that I really want to take them all, but unfortunately for credit <laughs> limit, we couldn't. But I'm planning to take ethics and genomics, which is correlate to my capstone. Yeah. A, a hot topic, um, certainly. And I, I'm going to come back to that. I want to just describe a little bit the research consortia, how that works with um, the other aspect of it that you attend? Yes. So... Uh, every month we have a uh, research ethics consortia, which is joined with the Museum of Science in Boston. So for the in-person student, we get to travel to Museum of Science. And it was really great because the topics that we talked about is really uh, the new emerging technologies. For example, in the next semester, we're going to talk about um, meat, uh, artificial meat, which is maybe we thought about things like is this topic really correlates with bioethics, but the course directors really imposes philosophical questions and bring up these industry um, research ethics, research ethicists and industries experts to talk about their own um, work in research ethics. So 
And we also, I think the highlight of the research at this consortium, we visited MIT Jamal Clinic, which is like the center of the AI. So if you are interested in the intersection of AI biotechnology, please, please, please take this research at this consortium because the experience you get through these uh, this consortia is something that is very valuable. And I don't think I could get it if I did not attend, especially in Harvard Medical School bioethics program. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for um, further explaining that. It's, it is a very unique opportunity that you've um, taken advantage of and, and that's great. You know, um, the other um, course, and you've all kind of alluded to, and this is sort of a question all the time that people ask is about the capstone. And what is this capstone? And you know, this um, what does it really mean? And how how does it play out? And you know, when do I find a mentor? Do I find a mentor right up front or not? And I, I'll just sort of introduce this as you know, it is a big component of. of of our program, as as everyone knows, and um, there's a survey that goes out initially to all of the um, applicants and to all of interested parties in um, being a mentor for the program. And as you all know, the goal is that you all have um, individual mentors and such. Um, but as far as topical and how it all comes together, and we call it the capstone experience, right? It's not necessarily a research project, although it can be. Um, it can be many things, and it depends on, you know, who you are and what your interests are and who you end up um, working with. And many times it is about um, identifying and a mentor and being open-minded to who your mentor is and learning from them. They may or may not be content experts, um, but you certainly have the vast um, faculty and hospitals across the city and all other individuals that they know and can introduce you to. So that's my introduction to that. Um, Abdul Rahman, why don't you um, talk about a little your capstone and how it's um, worked so far and maybe mention a, your, at least the topic of it and then we'll, we'll go around and um, get everyone's um, input on this. Yeah, sure. So the capstone is very interesting because I think about it as the practical part of the master's. You kind of choose whatever topic that you are interested in and you kind of focus in and choose a mentor that you are, that will help you no matter what, if you specialize in the content or not, that will kind of connect you with the people that you can kind of interested to talk to or to see what their perspective. So from from my for example, I am especially I kind of invested in the gene editing, especially in germline cells. That what my capstone field would be around. So with my mentor, Dr. Enzo, actually, even he is specialized in philosophy, he kind of have the opportunity to expose me to many people that in, specialize in, in this in this uh, area, and also because my part of my cabestan will be conducting interview, so he also kind of introduced me to many interesting people, but kind of have the talk with them to kind of see their perspective in that topic. So I think the cabestan experience, it it's sometimes kind of seem too much, but I think it's the most interesting part to kind of not only taking the, the learning to the next steps to kind of see what you are kind of learning by practical and kind of emphasize your learning and do it, not only learn it. That's great, thank you. And um, yeah, Insu is um, who Ardita was referring to. So being an online student, you just get, you also get to participate with the person over at the Museum of Science, even though you're online. It's great. And, and certainly from um, looking at gene editing and um, I'll go to you Ardita next, just because of, somewhat related um, of, you know, your genomics interests and such, but talk a little bit about your capstone and um, what the experience has been like for you. Thank you. So my capstone is about genomic data sharing and how do we address the public concerns and the deliverable that I would like to have for my capstone is to actually recommending strategies and policies to Indonesia because Indonesia is just starting to get into the genomic data sharing, how to bring genomic into public health. And even though that I'm taking the Indonesian perspective, I think so far my experience with my capstone mentor and faculty has been really, really um, good. As in, they really make sure that I bring my Indonesian perspective, although they're not Indonesian. So they really reminded me that, you know, uh, this capstone is about not only for yourself, but also your country. And throughout my experience, which is fascinating because I've learned so much about my country while I'm not there and through my faculty and my mentors. So it's really touching for me too that um, the faculty and my mentors really 
pay attention to you and wants to work together with you, which is very different to the environment um, in, back in medical school where it's very, um, very rigid and firm. But with, with the capstone experience, it's made enjoyable because they make sure of uh, you to get that experience and that you understand yourself and your capstone. And throughout the capstone sessions, honestly, it was really surprising because throughout the capstone, we talk about not only our projects, but uh, other peers' projects and how do we navigate our biases. So it's been like a personal journey. That's nice. That's great. And and Felix, um, as you comment, maybe you can um, mention a little bit more about um, the seminar, which is part of your overall experience in the capstone as well. Yes. So my capstone is actually the very highlight of the program. And uh, it's like one of the most fascinating topics I ever learned of in my life. So I'm uh, really interested in medical technology and clinical trials. And uh, my advisor and I, we are looking into brain-based visual prothesis. So these are neuronal implants, which help blind people see again. And we are asking like, what are the ethical implications of running a clinical trial with such a invasive, but also potentially helpful technology. And uh, it really started about two weeks before the semester began. So my mentor reached out to me. We had one-on-one -on -one discussions and uh, just like drafted what we wanted to do. And then every week on Tuesday, we are also meeting in class, um, get some additional input from Adita and like three other classmates. So it's always a very small and intimate uh, breakout session where you discuss with your classmates about how you research or your topic and whatever your capstone is then evolving. But we also have like a professor there giving out further expert input, like when you're designing an interview questionnaire because uh, you do interviews with maybe patients or researchers or whatever your capstone is. And they are also really supporting you there and helping you to prioritize because, I mean, it's just one year. And at, what, at the end of that year, your capstone is probably not really finished depending on what you are doing. So it's also setting the groundwork on how you continue that lifelong journey afterwards in a way. So mm -hmm. that's been really exciting. Yeah. It's a good point. It, it does continue um, because it goes by very fast and it's sort of setting the stage for perhaps what you can do next. So it's great to hear you say that. And, and Raja, um, any comment on the capstone from your perspective? I actually haven't started my capstone yet because um, right yes um because well and and I I would like to highlight this too if if that's okay because um sure. I started off as a two year part time student but because of my um you know to say the least you know onerous workload uh, with my own full time job so I decided to extend it to a three year program and you know, and, and Harvard MBE program allow me to do that. And I'm very thankful for that. And, you know, it, it just make my life a lot easier. Um, and, and to be honest, I can then focus on really learning the stuff, right. You know, really putting the time to do the readings, uh, to have, um, you know, to really kind of think through, um, you know the, the the discussions and and the and and the topics um and you know a lot of times when you have to really uh, learn something and you want to learn it good um you you need time you need effort and that you know this option for me to extend it to a three year um study really um allows me to you know put in more time and effort to to the stuff that I'm doing so I'll be starting my um uh, capstone next next year yeah yeah so um thanks and um you know and that's right you hadn't started yet and, and I did know that and one of the things is is that Fine. you know in the two-year part-time program you know the first year you don't um, you do it in the second but there are options and there are you know a handful of um, individuals such as yourself that do go on for a three-year program so we do try to be you know flexible in, in all of these aspects so so I think I think that's terrific um thanks for bringing that up and look forward to working with you on your um 
yeah. the whole capstone program, certainly. So, um, you know, one of the things I, I just want to tell you that you, for all of you, you've just touched upon the key elements and I, and I can't thank you enough. Um, we at the center can't thank you enough for, for joining us today. I, th I think you presented um, the program in such a way that it really does give the attendees a full picture of what it's like to, to be in this program coming from, you know, whether it's the online virtual um, program living in different parts of the world or coming to campus um, uh, from other countries and, and living here for the first time and and what that is like. And, and that's why we, you know, wanted the four of you to join us. So we're, we're just truly grateful for, you know, joining us for this time and um, answering all the questions. We've really attempted to answer all the questions that came into to us ahead of time and you've done a, just a great job at that. And, um, you know, I, I just wanna say, um, you know, a special thank you. Thank you from, you know, everyone here at the center. And what I'm gonna do now um, is um, thank you all. And um, we look forward to um, enjoy your break. And I'm gonna now turn this um, back over to um, Jesse, who is going to just do some summary um, wrap up comments to some of the uh, the individuals that are joining us today. I'm sure it's some things they're worrying, worrying or wondering about whether it's, you know, finances or, you know, who's really in the program. So Jesse, I'll turn it back over to you. I know you have some slides to share, but again, thank you to the four um, panelists. Um, you've just done a great job. So um, we really appreciate it. Thank you, Joni. Yes. And uh, thanks to the panelists as well. Um, can you all see the presentation? Great. Just a reminder to everybody that's here, uh, we do have the Q&A section of Zoom. And so we've been answering some of your questions throughout uh, and our panelists have the ability to see that as well. So I know some of you just asked a few and they're gonna kindly type those out, okay? So here I'm just gonna run through some quick slides and I wanted to mention that, you know, currently we have 122 students and about 40% of those are international. So just today we saw uh, students from Hong Kong, Indonesia, Saudi Arabia, and Germany. But when you're actually in the classroom, right, we have many more. Over the years, we've had students uh, from 27 different countries, right? And those are like Japan, into, uh, Pakistan, the Philippines, Canada, the Dominican Republic, and many more. So uh, there's really a global perspective when, when we're having discourse in the classroom. Now, these are the tuition and fees um, for the current academic year. So if you apply to the program and you are accepted, these will likely rise by a little bit. Um, of course, for uh, the part-time program, right, it's the same as, as, as the full-time costs, just split into two academic years. Okay. Um, on the website, if you've done some research, uh, you know, you'll see living expenses listed out and sometimes it can be a little confusing. But of course, if you're applying for the part-time online program, uh, you don't need to take into account those living expenses. Um, you know, many folks do have questions about the health insurance. If you're coming to the program and you wanna keep your own insurance, you can waive uh, that health insurance costs, okay? Next, many people, are, of course, are interested in financial aid and especially what that looks like as an international student. So after this session, we'll send out a whole bunch of resources uh, and links that we think you'll find helpful. Maybe you've already seen them. Uh, maybe you haven't. Um, there is something called the Harvard Committee on General Scholarships. And what you can actually do there is look through this website um, and see, you know, does your home country specifically have any scholarships? Uh, that are listed that you can apply to, or is there something related to your institution or your career? Um, we also really encourage you to look at uh, funding just from your home country. Um, in general, right, go to your local uh, government or the federal government. They might have scholarships, and so I uh, just encourage you to do a lot of research on that. Also, with your own um, employer, right? Uh, uh, human resources very well may, might, might have something that, that can help you uh, go study somewhere. Maybe your job will help to pay for it. So really just explore all the resources that are open to you. Uh, also at HMS is the Dean's Scholarship. Uh, and this is financial need based, but anybody is welcome to apply to this. And so I encourage you know anyone who has 
uh, been accepted to the program that you apply to the Dean's Scholarship, and that's a 15% tuition reduction. Um, here, I would like to note that if you are uh, an international student here with us, a prospective international student today, uh, and you want to come study full time, um, there is a requirement that you have to show proof of funding in US dollars now. And so that's the tuition as well as the cost of living. And if you're accepted to the program, we'll reach out and start this process and help you get all of your materials together. Uh, there's even resources for local banks that HMS works with if you need to open an account to actually show those funds in US dollars. But really just, you know, if you're interested in this program uh, and you want to come study full-time international, start thinking about uh, getting those funds together um, and being ready to, to submit your materials because that is how you're going to get your I-20. And once we send the I-20, that's how you're going to get the uh, visa interview at your local consulate or embassy, okay? Now, here's our admissions process. It's a totally online application, of course. Any institution in your application that you've marked, you've attended, we will need to see an unofficial transcript from. And so that can be a PDF uh, or a really clear image. An updated CV, um, clear and easy to read, and also a statement of purpose, and we'll touch more on that in, the, in a little bit. Three letters of recommendation. Uh, these should come from colleagues or professors or supervisors, someone that can uh, speak to the quality of your character and, and, and why it makes sense that you should uh, come get a degree in bioethics. So if you are curious about um, uh, English proficiency scores, you only need to provide uh, that score or that test if you uh, have a degree from an institution where the primary language of instruction was not English. So if you did go to school and the language of instruction was not English at any place you went, uh, th then you will have to submit these scores. And if you haven't done one uh, and now you're learning, you do have to submit it. Uh, don't worry. You know, I, we're a little close to the deadline, but Duolingo actually makes it uh, really easy um, to do this. You know, you'll take that exam and they'll just send you your scores in a day or two. So here is the statement of purpose. And, you know, this should really be a thoughtful narrative of why you want to study bioethics, why it's important to you, and why at Harvard. So if you kind of follow these four questions, these, these guidelines that we have here, and, and you can see this on the website, then you, know, you should be able to produce a really good uh, a statement of purpose for our admissions committee to read. Again, the recommenders, they're usually professors or teachers, supervisors, or colleagues. Um, if you're interested in applying now, definitely start speaking with them soon. But uh, I, I do want to highlight that though the deadline is January 5th, we know that you know during the holidays, getting this all together can be tough. So there is some leeway around January 5th. If you are just getting, if those letters are still coming in, um, that's okay, right? We'll, we'll work with you to make sure that we can uh, read your application if you're interested in studying for the in-person program. Now, uh, I know many of our panelists um, talked about housing. Thank you. Uh, yes, this can be tough. So I really um, you know, encourage you to, to look at this even now, right? if, even if you haven't been accepted, start, start looking at the uh, info that we have here. Again, I'll send these links out uh, after the session, but they are, are really wonderful resources. Um, and so, you know, if you're looking to live right here near the medical campus, right, you're going to try for Vanderbilt Hall. Uh, but if you want to live in Cambridge, that's totally okay, too. Um, this this HU housing link, that will help you live in Cambridge as well. Um, or if you want to live in any of the surrounding area, right, there's a whole resource just for living off campus. So, again, I'll be sending this to you soon. And as for what's next, um, January 5th is that in-person deadline. 
Uh, but of course, you know, some leeway, just communicate with us and, and we'll help you. Uh, we'll help you out if you have to submit things a little bit late. OK, March 1st for the online program. You have a bit more time there, but still, uh, uh, you know, start looking at your funding and start asking for letters of recommendation. Um, you know, we have a newsletter and we've got a whole slew of, of uh, social media. So if you want to keep up to date um, on anything with the center please feel free to do so. So thank you everybody for coming today. Um, thank you, Dr. Brendel for opening the session. Thank you, Dr. Bashansky for moderating. And uh, thank you, Roger, Abdul Rahman, Felix, and Ardita very much. Um, I think we had a great conversation and this has been wonderful. So I wish everybody a good day. Bye everyone.